All right, so um, I also bring greetings to you this morning from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and from the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at CDC where our purpose and our vision is a world and to realize a world where all people have the opportunity to attain the best health possible. So as I, I thought about, um, as I was preparing for this presentation, the first thing that occurred to me is I'm sure some of y'all are thinking, why would uh, someone from a biomedical, highly technical, data-driven institution, um, the nation's public health agency that serves the entire world, why would someone from that place be here to, to talk about something soft like storytelling, right? And so I wanted to just, you know, take a minute to, to tell you a little bit about me and kind of what brings me to this moment of, of talking about um, storytelling. Um, as Dr. Kim said, I have a, a doctorate in medical anthropology and I was able to um, kind of mid-career go back to school and pursue that, and pursue that training. And um, there were things going on in the agency at that time where we were starting to grapple with issues of culture and culture and health. And it was reduced to images and language, right? So if we were working with an African-American community, you put black people on the brochure, and that was culturally appropriate. And if we were working with a Latino, Spanish-speaking community, we did a direct translation into Spanish and said that was culturally appropriate. And so while I was certainly not the expert on culture, I knew it was more than that. And so I was able to essentially take a leave from work and, and go back to school and study um, cultural anthropology and, and medical anthropology. And as I was in that, in that, that training, um, you know, we mostly read a lot. I mean, we would read like 600 pages a week. I mean, I had a class where we had read a book a week with a lot of reading, a lot of writing, a lot of analysis, a lot of looking at the world differently. And that experience really singularly changed my whole perspective about public health and the practice of public health. And um, I remember uh, getting a comment on one of my papers from a professor and she said, she said, your writing reads like medical writing. And that was a critique. You know, it's like, I don't, and she didn't really know where I came from or any of that, but. So I said about um, mastering what would be more a humanity style of writing. And I really loved it. And, you know, ethnographies, which many of you may be familiar with, is a, um, which is, is what, a lot of anthropologists do, and particularly cultural anthropologists, is a, is a systematic description, right, of, of some contemporary issue. And in medical anthropology, it's the cultural analysis of, of a health issue. And so ethnographies, at their core, when they're ultimately written, is really the telling of a story in a very systematic and detailed way. And so when I, when I went back to work um, at CDC, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of tension, I don't need to, to tell you this, between, um, you know, kind of the quantitative, you know, technical, biomedical model and that, and the, and the paradigm of something like cultural anthropology. And so I was trying to bridge those, those two things. And I can tell you when I came back to work and I was my humanities lofty sort of writing just did not sit well because they prefer a, a blunt, authoritative, fact-driven piece. Or if you've ever read an MMWR, like nothing like flowery about it. So I started, when I came to the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, I started writing um, the Conversations in Equity blog. And it was my way to satisfy my kind of qualitative anthropological self with the expectations of public health practice, 
that are grounded in epidemiology and evidence-based practice. And so I'm going to talk a lot about the, the blog today as kind of my expression of, of storytelling in public health as a way to advance health equity and from the standpoint of an institution like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I hear that there is someone here who is studying uh, narratives in medicine. It's nice to meet you. And I decided that if there are any questions at the end of this talk, they're going to come to you because you're, <laughs> you're, our, you're our expert. Okay. So these are my objectives for this morning. I want to, to just talk about how storytelling can be used as a tool for promoting health equity. I'm going to say something about types of stories. This is some things I've gleaned from the literature. Um, I'm going to share some stories in, in, the, in CDC's Conversations in Equity blog. And then I'll talk a little bit about how to create stories. So there are numerous um, definitions of the concept of storytelling. And, but there are some common elements that, that cut across these definitions um, that, about storytelling that include things like it is an effort to communicate events using words, either prose or poetry, images, and sounds, often including improvisation or embellishment. And so the, the definitions that I have here, it says that storytelling describes also the social and cultural activity of sharing stories. And I think all cultures do that, sometimes with improvisation, sometimes with theatrics or embellishment. And every culture has its own story or narratives. And I, and I know that for um, particular art scholar of narratives in medicine, that there are distinctions in the literature between what a narrative is, what a story is, but I didn't want to really weight the, the talk in that way. I want this to be kind of much more um, practical in its orientation. And so um, every culture as it has its own stories or narratives which are shared as a means of entertainment, um, as a means of, for educating people, for cultural preservation, or instilling moral values. Um, storytelling has also been defined as an interactive process that uses sign language or, or an oral medium, and it allows us to share stories with others. So storytelling in public health, um, what we find is that there is a growing literature in public health about the utility of storytelling in research, in the patient-provider encounters, and in public health practice as a health communication strategy. And I know that that's one of the reasons why this is a big focus for your seminar this week. And so what um, some scholars have said about storytelling in public health is that it's a tool. It's a tool for increasing understanding about the context in which people negotiate health. And I can't say enough about how important our understanding of the social context is when we are looking to change behaviors. Um, it, it's used to strengthen the participation of communities in addressing health issues and in building bridges between researchers and target populations. Um, one of the kind of most uncomfortable moments I have all the time is when someone asks me what it is that I do. Or if they ask me, well, what do you do at CDC, then they're sort of halfway there. But when I said, well, you know, we try to reduce health disparities and advance health equity, and they're like, well, what is that? I guess this is a constant sort of a what is that? And then I had you know, someone in my office, one of the secretaries, she asked like the most profound question that ever, right? She said, how can I use what we do here with the people back home? She's from a small community somewhere in, in Georgia um, to help them. And you know, as a federal agency and as a national organization, we're like three times removed from the community. But the fact that people who are right in my office don't necessarily know how what we do, you know, kind of 
affects real people, I think is an important question. And so the blog is one way that I try to, to bridge that gap. And then the other thing about storytelling and public health, the stories can give a voice to people's own experiences and connect knowledge to action. It is, however, essential that stories are realistic and credible to the audience in the sense of true to life characters. And so just again, just to kind of drive home a little bit more why stories are important, they provide the mechanism by which doctors and patients communicate and understand the meaning of illness and possible ways of dealing with it. Um, a few years ago, one of my colleagues was invited by uh, the Journal of Clinical Therapeutics, I think is the name of it, and to talk about cultural aspects of diabetes among African Americans. And so he contacted me and he said, you know, hey, would you like want to write this paper with me? And I said, sure, and we, uh, we used this framework um, by an anthropologist named Arthur Kleiman. It was an illness narratives framework, and it asked like a series of questions that allows the, the physician or the provider to understand things like you know, how, how people um, understand diabetes and how they acquired it. And I've heard some really interesting things from people about diabetes and, and where they thought it came from and, and why you know, they thought they developed it. And before my anthropology training, I would have been, first of all, compelled to say, nope, that's not right. I don't know who told you that, but that is just ex not right. It's this, right? And I would have given them this like very clinical and very, you know, something that they didn't even hear, explanation. But, but now I know, I know to, to listen and to listen differently. Um, and the other thing, you know, I've been in, like I get to sit in like really high level meetings. And um, there was a meeting I was in, it was about how are we gonna reduce uh, disparities in colorectal screening. And I won't like, don't, we don't have time for you to go into all the details now, but people, so I was in a room with a bunch of physicians and so one of them was saying, you know, our hospital provides colonoscopies at no cost, but we still have a 40% no-show rate. And then there was this one, and they were like, all these things about why people aren't getting screened. And one of the physicians says, well, we don't have that problem. And he said, you know, we have a patient navigator program and, you know, you know people show up. So I whispered to him, I said, do you ever ask your patient navigator what people in the community are saying? And he said, no. So sort of like, I don't need to know that they can know that. But I would argue that we, we do need to know that because that will help others. And so I said things in rooms that just sort of mess up the conversation. I said, you know, well, there are two conversations that go on. There's one that goes on in the physician's office, right, where people will come in and they'll say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and they'll not. And then there's another conversation that goes on in the community that will completely unravel whatever you thought you achieved in the exam room. So sharing stories also builds trust um, between providers and patients. And, and it provides a framework um, for life and it helps us deal with major life events. And they can also be therapeutic. You know, when we share our struggles, when we share that, well, you know, I had this health issue, but I was able to get it under control. Those things are therapeutic and, and for others. They form a history and they can bridge generations to provide continuity and thoughts, ideas, values, and culture. They can also amuse and entertain. And they are a repository of knowledge. And I have to add that some of this is good knowledge and some of it not so good. I want to ask how many of you have ever heard of um, the Tuskegee syphilis study? And that was a, a, it was an experiment, actually. It was highly unethical. All kinds of things happened, and they are put in place to avoid that from happening again. It was a 40-year study. It ended around 1972. But we continue to hear people reference the Tuskegee syphilis study. 
anything that looks a little awry in the community about something that public health is doing, they will say, mm, you know, you remember the Tuskegee syphilis study, right? So those are things that we have to overcome. And I have to, I'm very happy to say that our office is collaborating with Tuskegee University. It'll be now four years where we are, we co-host with them these public health ethics forums. We do it at CDC. And we're really trying to intentionally redefine CDC's historic relationship with Tuskegee University and with that community. So let's talk a little bit about some types of stories. So in an article by uh, Tess Thompson and Matt Cruder about written narratives in public health, they describe three types of stories. One of them they call authentic stories, which have the benefit of being perceived as realistic and persuasive. They're fic fictional stories, which they say are based on observations and experiences that provide realistic details and is written or told in a voice that is easily understood by the audience. And then they have composite stories, which are narratives that are gathered through formative research and use realistic details that can, that can be fictionalized and shaped into unified, factually accurate stories. Now, when I started writing the blog, I wasn't really driven by these sort of you know, models or typologies. I hadn't really done that sort of research. I was, as I was saying earlier, writing from my experience, um, which you're going to see, um, and, and really trying to bridge what the, the knowledge is that we produce from CDC with what people in the community would understand. And I'll say, um, and you'll see this um, in some of the blogs I'm going to read, I, I was born and raised in, in Richmond, Virginia, so I'm a Southerner. Um, I was raised by my grandmother from about age 11, so I'm really like about 120 years old right now. Um, in terms of my thinking, I mean, it's amazing how with, with the world experience I've had, you know, I never lose my grandmother's voice, right? She'll come in my head and something. So you're gonna. You're going to hear that. OK. So I want to share this story. It's called Confronting Cancer with Courage, Confidence, and a Caring Community. This is an authentic story about one woman's experience with a diagnosis of breast cancer. And only her name and the name of her doctor were changed like, to protect her identity. However, her experience is not uncommon. So. This is my, my blog about that. Um, overcast skies and a light drizzle of rain followed Charlotte as she returned to the doctor's office to find out the results of the needle biopsy of her left breast. So confident that the white spot on the mammogram film reflected a small deposit of benign, non-cancerous calcium deposits, she didn't even consider asking any of her friends to come with her to this follow-up visit with the doctor. After having her weight and blood pressure recorded by one of the nurses, Dr. Hernandez joined Charlotte in the exam room. She sat on the stool across from Charlotte, opened her medical record, and not looking up from the page said, it looks like you have a cancer. She went on to describe treatment options and next steps, but all Charlotte could remember was, it looks like you have a cancer. She left the office in a daze, and as she walked through the parking lot to her car, she could feel a wave of hysteria working its way from her feet to her head. Charlotte tried to calm herself and decided the best way to regroup was to go back to work and busy herself with the demands of her job as a dishwasher in a nearby restaurant. Now more than ever, she realized how much she relied on every dime she earned at the restaurant. If she has to undergo surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation treatments, she was going to end up unemployed. 
working as a dishwasher simply did not provide the kind of sick leave, paid or unpaid, needed to maintain employment while undergoing cancer treatments. She was also going to have to give up her apartment once her paycheck stopped and find someone to live with for at least the next year. Were there resources available in her city to help her? Could she move back home with her sister who lives in the neighboring state and receive the treatment she needs at minimal cost? Should she tell her employer now or wait until she had figured out what she was going to do next? The statement, it looks like you have a cancer, had effectively turned her life upside down. Headed to her car at the end of her shift, she felt the swirl of hysteria surround and try to overtake her again. And then I talk about cancer, different kinds of cancers, the, the, the why there's a lower incidence of breast cancer among black women, but a higher mortality rate. And maybe some of these things that we hear from Charlotte are actually underlying that prevalence. So my example of a fictional story, and I don't think these stories necessarily fit comfortably in all of these categories, but I titled this one, I Just Didn't Want to Hear Any More Bad News. And these are things that I hear in the community all the time. Um, and what makes this fictional is where I say these things happened and the circumstances, but the statement, I just didn't want to hear any more bad news, was real. And it was shared by people who didn't know each other and who were in different states. They all happened to be African American, but I just wanted to share um, part of that blog. So gathered in the parking lot of my hometown church, family and friends were catching up with each other before leaving the annual homecoming service and dinner. Now you have to be from the South to know, you have to have grown up in a black Baptist church, Dr. Kim is not here, to know what homecoming is, right? So while in the parking lot, I overheard a conversation between two cousins. One was sharing that she had attended two funerals the day before, and her husband had been ill for several months. And caring for, hus her, for her husband, maintaining a full-time job outside the home, and responding to the needs of her adult children and grandchildren had taken their toll on her physically and emotionally. She also commented that she was experiencing back pain, but decided it was only arthritis. In this cultural context, arthritis is a minor, recurring, and mostly annoying pain that is associated with aging. She had recently celebrated her 51st birthday. Her cousin asked if she had gone to see the doctor about the pain in her back, and she replied, no, I just didn't want to hear any more bad news. Back in Atlanta, I attended a high school basketball game and sat beside the uncle of one of the girls on the dance team that would perform at halftime. He knew I worked at CDC and was curious about my work at the agency. I described our focus on eliminating health disparities, and this ultimately led to a conversation about a health issue he was having. He told me that for several months, he had been seeing blood in his stools. He was very concerned and wondered if it might just be hemorrhoids. I asked if he had gone to see a doctor about this, and he said, no, I just don't want to hear any bad news. When I was doing my doctoral research, I, I, studied, um, I studied two things. I studied why high socioeconomic status did not protect black women from obesity, as it appears to protect white women, and I studied um, black men with type 2 obesity type 2 diabetes, they had a, a, like, like twice the rate, even though in terms of their obesity profile at that time, they had a lower obesity profile. And we understand obesity to be like one of the principal risk factors for diabetes. And um, 
And we had a program in North Carolina, and you know, people could come in, they could, they could be screened, they could get um, all kinds of educational information, and, and the, the, the family that owned the building that we were leased in for this program, um, the son had every symptom of diabetes, but he absolutely refused to be tested. And so when I talked to him about that, because when I got there, they said, oh, Leandris, maybe you can talk him into, you know, and I talked to him and he said, that's what he said, he said, I'm taking care of my elderly parents. He said, the economy's not good. This building he pointed to is not leased that they own. He said, this just isn't a good time to know, right? So I came back to, to, to the office and I said, people don't want to know. And they just about ran me out of the building. Said, what do you mean? People, of course they want to know. And you know, like. And ultimately, some years later, they came back. They was like, yeah, we understand what you were saying. But again, whenever we tell someone that they have a health problem, there's this shift that you go from like well to sick you know, there are all kinds of implications associated with that socially and otherwise. And you know, people aren't necessarily in a hurry um, to know. But from the standpoint of primary prevention, that's exactly when we want that. We want someone in the doctor's office much before four months of bleeding. I mean, that could be very, very serious. Okay. So I'm gonna go on to this next. My last example is one that is considered, I would consider a composite story, um, as well as an authentic one. And these are things I can't really say that there's a literature that has defined silence as a risk factor for health disparities, but again, it's what I hear and what I see in my community. And so I'll just read a little bit of this. So having been raised in the South by my grandmother, I was taught there were topics that were inappropriate to discuss in public. There often was a culture of silence around issues of sexuality, marital infidelity, homophobia and other forms of sexual difference, poverty, neglect and abuse, and specific health problems people were experiencing. It wasn't that people didn't talk about these matters. They just didn't talk about them in public spaces. Instead, we whispered about them in safe, private spaces with people who shared our sensibilities. Any public talk that would expose, embarrass, alienate, or bring harm to a member of our family or close social network was avoided. While some of this silence was meant to be protective, there were unintended negative health consequences that emerged. In this blog, I argue that a culture of silence continues to exist in some communities and that silence can be a risk factor for health disparities. In deference to scholars like Paulo Freire who have more fully and theoretically described the existence of a culture of silence, my purpose is more practical and interpersonal and in that I want to spark a conversation about ways silence can undermine important health decisions and enable preventable health disparities. I conclude with the idea that giving voice to issues that have been silenced and related to health outcomes might contribute to reducing and eliminating health disparities. And so I go on in that blog to talk about things like, like obesity and obesity among black women and how you know, we, would, we would never confront someone and, and say, you know, you really might want to come go walking with me or something like that, right? And there are ways that people talk about um, large body forms in the black community like thick, big bone, plus size, stout. I mean, I could just go, but, but, but obese is like an ugly word. Like, I mean, you would have to be what we would consider morbidly obese 
for someone to actually call you out as, as being obese. So, um, so anyway, in, this, in that particular blog, I try to create a space where people can, you know, in a safe space, talk about these kinds of issues. So that, last thing I'll say about that is, you know, what I stay concerned about is when everything a community ever hears about itself is negative, at some point people just sort of shut down and they're like, I can't hear it anymore. I mean, I'm just trying to live. I'm just trying to have the best quality of life that's available to me. And all I ever get back from you public health people is, you know, in five minutes I'm, I'm going to be out of here. You know, or it's like it's never kind of good news. So we're not trying to sh change the facts, but to really figure out how to deal with them in the best way. Okay, so I want to come into the end. I'm going to talk about creating stories. Again, this comes from Thompson and Cruder. So they talk about, first of all, you choose a point of view. You can tell a lot of the blogs, the ones that I write, um, I'm the speaker. I'm telling a particular story about something that has happened. Who am I talking to? You know, it's to the general public, it's to the um, you know, the, the person who is, is not a, a health professional necessarily, even though I certainly want health professionals to engage with the blog. And then in what form? And this form is in the blog form, it's in a written form. In terms of establishing the con conflict, I think in public health and healthcare, this is typically a health issue or a related social determinant of health. In terms of shaping the story, you know, have a structure. And so the structure that we use is we tell a story, we then insert this CDC data, and then we insert um, CDC strategies, which these are things that we have found to be evidence-based and will work. And then we end with, so what are you doing in your community about this? And that invites people to submit comments, share things that they're doing, you know, raise questions. Um, incorporate details. I think what we want to do with the story is to kind of more so than the blunt, you know, peer-reviewed scientific publication is to create a vivid imagery that helps the reader to connect with the characters in the story. It's very important for someone to say, to see themselves um, in that situation. We also want to evoke emotion. I think that's one of the kind of the principal things that come, come out of stories is that we're not just connecting intellectually, but we're having a, an emotional connection. Um, to use a natural voice, um, and I'm gonna say like to avoid jargon. I, one of my classmates told me one time, and so I've been very conscientious about that from that day forward. And this was like some years ago, but she said, you always sound like the CDC. I mean, you say something and man, I start rattling off this and that. I mean, she said, you always sound like, and I thought, that's horrible. I don't want to always sound like the CDC. So I've been much more um, thoughtful about how I respond, because it's almost like this thing that will just like get triggered. And also solicit feedback and revise. You know, in anthropology, I was told, you know, that writing is rewriting, right? We, and then at CDC, of course, we have a very elaborate system of review. You know, people are going to, they don't mess with my story, but they are going to look at the data and they're going to look at the strategies and, and this type of thing. Okay, so I know that today you are going to visit the Health is a Human Right exhibit which was how we celebrated the 25th anniversary of our office. And I wrote a blog about it that I titled Making Things Right. And, and I hope you, you know, when you are able to get online, um, to go to, to read that because um, one of, and there were many motivations, but one of the motivations for me for commissioning that exhibit is that um, that there, is a, there was a perception, and I hope we've disrupted it, 
that, you know, we've, there have always been health disparities, there always will be health disparities. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a personal responsibility thing. Um, certain communities just don't want to be healthy. You know, why are we continuing to talk about this? And I wanted to demonstrate that we didn't just get up this morning and there were health disparities, that they are historically, um, socially constructed, they are patterned, we can anticipate it. You know, I can right now just about drive through a community and on the basis of what's there, I could pretty much tell you who lives there, right? And there are all kinds of structures that keep these things in place. So the exhibit was to expose that and say, these are the complexities of what we're dealing with if we want to really be effective in reducing um, health disparities. And I have to tell you that of all the things I've been able to do in my career, um, this is one of the most proud, of things I'm most proud of, the fact that, that Georgia State took it up. There's an online version. Some folk are headed to Spain to give a presentation on it at a museum conference. And I'm like, wow, you know, because I mean, that's real. I mean, I just, I'm just humbled and just really excited about that. And I look forward to what you all think about it. I, w I was not the curator. <clears throat> the curator is Louise Shaw. Um, maybe you'll get to meet her sometime. But, but she really, um, in all the meetings we had, she took all the things I said to her and some of my colleagues, and she created um, this exhibit. And so I want to end, and I want to share a little bit, something a little bit more lighthearted. And this is a story about the Office of Minority Health as we, this year, um, celebrate the 30th anniversary of the office. And this is how we're really promoting it. Okay, for 30 years, CDC has had one office focused on one mission, and that is reducing health disparities. It started with the belief that this mission was possible. And today I want to share briefly a history of our office. The Federal Office of Minority Health was established in 1986 with CDC's first Office of Minority Health in 1988 under the direction of CDC's first Associate Director for Minority Health, Dr. Reuben Warren. He believed the mission was possible. In 1998, Dr. Walter Williams became the second leader of the office as Associate Director for Minority Health and Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. He believed the mission was possible. In 2011, I was appointed to lead what is now the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, affectionately known as OMHHE which is now comprised of the offices of women's health, minority health and health equity, and diversity and inclusion management. We have come a long way in 30 years, and we still believe that the mission is possible. Today, and this was a, earlier in the year, we formally announce that the former di directors are united in making the mission of healthy lives for everyone possible. And we want you to join that effort. So what are we really asking? We want to encourage you to become a public health agent of change to reduce health disparities. This is a mission that we have all accepted. The question now is, Will you?
stay tuned. Thank you very much.